If you want to see your name at the beginning of all of our videos, as well as see exclusive content here on the homestead, please feel free to join our Patreon. Memberships start off at just a dollar a month. And as always, thank you for your support. You're getting a silver fox for this video, which is a bit ironic. But if you are looking for a blue-eyed white mini rex, I normally have at least one for sale per quarter that is showable. And I'm very picky when it comes to my showable animals. So reach out to me in my DMs. We can chat, we can talk. With that being said, um, a lot of times it is better to reach out to someone else who might have a showable animal who's breeding on a larger scale. With that said, I know a few of my breeder friends do know of blue-eyed white breeders across the country. So um, if y'all could just answer down with people who breed blue-eyed white mini rex in the comments, I would be so grateful. Bonus points if you can find a breeder in the Pacific Northwest. One thing I absolutely love about our community is being able to connect with each other and being able to help out each other the best way that we can. So I would absolutely love if y'all had suggestions or breeders that y'all really liked. I think we can do that for you real quick. So at four weeks old, it's a bit hard to tell with these guys if they're going to be fantastic or not, but I'll show you what I'm really looking at. The biggest thing I look for at four weeks is the hip and foot base. I want nice, wide, spread apart feet that are facing forwards. And I want to see that base continue to be wide and set from a back view and a top view. So Sonodrop here has a nice wide set foot and doesn't seem to have any pinching in his hind quarter. That's the biggest thing I'm looking for at this age. Now compared to his sister Lily, she does have a nice wide foot base, but I'm kind of side eyeing those heels. Her feet are mostly straight, but I'm kind of side eyeing it. So I'm going to get her posed up and again look at that whole view just to see if it pulls in on the back. And she's honestly not bad, but it's something I'm going to keep an eye on. Now, what I also look at at this age is things like this, where this rabbit has had a chunk of its ear bitten off by its mother, and then off colorations, which again, this little caster does. And Jen, if you're watching this right now, I just, I wanted to show you because I figured this is the only way. That undercoat right there looks black to me. So I don't think this is an amber. I know we were talking about it in the comments, but I'm pretty sure that this is just a really horribly colored high roughest caster. But that honestly looks black. But look, I figured out a way to share. But yeah, those are kind of the things that um, I look at when it comes to four weeks of age and rabbits. Oh, Google account 8538. You're silly. Rabbits don't have the cognizant brain function to really understand that. And they can't just yeet us the fetus based on an idea that they don't even know about. And the thing is, rabbits can be horrible mothers. They can cannibalize their own babies, stomp them, generally just not take care of them for a multitude of reasons. But this is the same kind of mentality that I have seen in the rescue world when it comes to dogs. When instead of spay aborting animals, they let them have the babies because the bitch would be big sad. It just has the same kind of feel to it. But yeah, rabbits don't think that way. But look at my beautiful blue-eyed white baby. Is she not stunning? I am touching up her white spots right now because she has some grossness on it from her siblings and her piling in a corner and peeing on each other. Anytime we breed our animals, we will take note of who is bred with who, if they had babies, all of that good stuff. Now, with that being said, we were talking about Lulu having strikes. And she had been bred four times, didn't catch any of those four times. Or rather, it'd be four now if she didn't catch. But we were breeding her with two different bucks. We bred her twice with Strawberry and twice with Gigi. Now, Strawberry is a bit fickle when it comes to breeding. 
kind of happens when your buck's overweight. So in those instances, the strikes wouldn't count against Lulu for realsies. I just make note of them. Now, with her not catching with Gigi, that's a huge issue. That buck knows his job very well, multiple fall-offs, good to go. He has sired many a litter. So those strikes would go against then Lulu. So a lot of times it just has to do with the bucks we're breeding them with, how the does reception is of them. But also the strike system is kind of like a game of whose line is it in any way. Nothing makes sense and the points don't count. So we already had somebody answer you in the comments, but I just wanted to make this a bit of a point. If I ever say something that like y'all, you know, don't understand, be it, be it because I'm using a weird word or you're new to my channel, be like the commenter and just ask. Because I promise I will either answer in the comments or a video or somebody else will answer for me. Because sometimes I just get into my jargon mode and I just don't even realize it. Now, with that being said, um, you're not necessarily on bunny talk, you're on meat rabbit talk or farm talk or homesteading talk, just depending on which section you're in. So that can be very unfamiliar territory when it comes to some of these words. But when we talk about catching, we're talking about a doe being pregnant. And when we talk about pulling fur, it's a sign that they are going into labor or getting ready for babies, or in some instances have a false pregnancy. And basically what they're doing is they're pulling fur from their dewlap, their chest, their stomach. Some does will pull themselves bare. And what they're going to do is they're going to take that fur and line their nest to keep the babies warm. So that's what all that means. But y'all feel free to ask any kinds of questions. I, I'll answer them a million times. I don't really worry about it. <laughs> but this also gives you a chance to look at the glory that is Mr. Fatty McFatterson and his little mini dewlap he's not supposed to have. I'm going to a show here in about two weeks, and I need to decide who I'm taking. Uh, I want to take Velma. She's a senior now. She's filled in a bit better, so I feel like she's going to do better against the other casters. Because she had good remarks on type and ring definition, but their biggest problem was she was still a very young junior, and she wasn't filled in quite enough to really do much. She placed as a junior at one show but was then beaten out of best of variety by a senior doe. So I'm going to take her again and see how she does. Cyrax is going again. She did extremely well at the last show, and I want to get another leg on her. As a junior, she got best opposite sex, so I'd like to continue that pattern as she gets older. And I would really like to finish out her grand before she has babies, but we'll see how that goes. If Lulu continues to be her same old Lulu self, she'll be going to show. I have one more leg to finish off on her for her grand. Baby Sheba here will be making her very first debut as a junior silver fox. Everyone say hi to Queen real quick. She's not going to show. I just wanted to show how cute she was. And then my friend wants me to bring a senior silver fox to show. So I'm trying to figure out if I were to bring a senior, who would I bring? Wiley's not the best on the show table, but he has excellent type, but his fur is lacking. Maybe I'll take Meatloaf and see how he does, but he's over-silvered. He's okay on type, though. It's just that silvering, and his fur is pretty good, so maybe we'll take Meatloaf. And then I thought about bringing Nina because Kara said she's not bringing a senior, so I wouldn't feel too bad about bringing one of Kara's to show because my friend wants me to bring a senior to show against her. But I'm kind of on the fence about that one. Just because Neen is pretty happy just to chill. And I've finally gotten her to the point where she just chills. We don't have freakouts. She's just a sleepy monster. And I don't want to stress her out too much. She's so easily stressed. So I don't think I'm going to bring Miss Nina. But look how glorious this baby is. She is just the chunkiest girl. And look, we've even gotten to a point where I can pet her. Isn't that lovely? When I first got this doe, there was no calm, there was no pet, so I am very happy with how far this monster has come, because she is just the sweetest thing. But I definitely got distracted on the point of this video. So yeah, just pay attention to the first few I put in there. Those are the ones we're looking at taking to show. Once you stop at Sheba, I'm not sure from there. What you doing, queen? 
What you doing, Queenie girl? You getting ready for some babies? You stashing? You're gonna be such a good mama. Where are you putting that? Can we put that in the box? Such a good mama. Well, Lulu is still holding on to her hostages, but it looks like Queen is getting very well prepared on her end. Uh, I just put this box in today and already she is hay stashing and getting ready for her round of babies. This will be her first litter, so I'm slightly worried about that, but her mom was absolutely excellent when it came to being a mother, so I'm not too awful worried, and hopefully we'll get some pretty babies. There she goes. She's actually in the box stuffing now. So at least we'll have babies on the farm within the next couple days. Would I ever stop breeding strawberry if it's him not producing? And understand with this question, Strawberry just had a litter with one of my friend's mini racks. So he can and every once in a while does have babies. His biggest problem is his weight. And when he does have babies, they are absolutely gorgeous. Look at Cyrax and Velma. Heck, look at this little Harlequin doe I have, but she's pretty for a different reason. I'll continue to use Strawberry in my breeding program as long as he benefits the program. And yes, it does get kind of aggravating at times when he doesn't produce kits, but because he is my daughter Showbuck and he doesn't really get a strike out, so to speak, he's basically here forever. And I'm going to use his genetics to improve my program. Now the goal is eventually to get a really nice looking buck out of him that will breed more often than he does. That is easier to keep within condition. So for now, I use Strawberry some of the times, I use GG other of the times. And eventually, hopefully, we'll get a buck that is a little better at his job. The biggest piece of advice that I can give when it comes to genetic diversity in rabbits is good record keeping. That'll be your saving grace when it comes to having a very small populace of rabbits and breeding them together and getting the best. Online, you can Google rabbit line breeding charts as well that will walk you through the process of breeding together a single pair of rabbits. And with this line breeding chart, you can technically breed them together for about four generations before you would need an outcrossing. Now, with that being said, when it comes to line breeding in rabbits, they do very well compared to other species on a high coefficient of inbreeding. A lot of the rabbits that I have run around 5 to 20 percent. The best in my barn having a higher percentage than a lower percentage. Now with that being said, the heavier you line breed, the heavier you are going to need to cull. Which isn't a problem when you are raising for meat. You want to keep the best of the best and you want to get rid of any kind of issues. These issues could be small. So in the show world, it can be something as small as off-white colors or something as bad as malocclusion or split penis. You want to cull heavy for these things because as your genetic pool shrinks, those things are going to come to the surface. Now understand that these are already in your lines. It's just the closer you breed these rabbits together, the fewer genetics there are to pick from when these rabbits are breeding. Now, with that being said, if you have either two pairs of rabbits or a breeding trio, if you correctly follow the line breeding charts and play around with it, cull heavy, only keep the best of the best, you could, in theory, never need an outcrossing. And again, that is just through good record keeping and kind of playing with those lines and separating them out. I'm going to do that with these Satans who are getting used to me and I'm so happy. Isn't that right, Butters? Look, they actually stay at the door when I'm here instead of running off. We're getting to be friends now and I'm okay with that. I'm gonna have the sweetest Satans ever. Now ask me about that when they hit their teenage phase here in a few months. Uh, then, then we'll talk about if I was successful or not. It isn't often that I am raising rabbits in the house. For the blue-eyed white litter, Daisy is just inside because she is a pet that I am using currently for my blue-eyed white program. 
With that being said, what I will do is if I have babies that I am shelving or raising in the house, I will slowly introduce them in the outside. For shelved babies, this means as soon as they hit about two weeks old, I will start putting them out in increments outside. If that's in the winter, I'll start with three to four hours at a time and slowly work my way up. If it's in the summer, as soon as they hit about two weeks old, I just kind of throw them outside because it's warm enough for them. For the babies currently in the house that are, what are they now? They're four weeks old. Um, once they hit eight weeks, they'll go into the garage for a week and then they'll just go straight out to the barn. So they'll be completely outside 100% of the time between nine and 10 weeks. This is a well-bred mini Rex. I have 10 generations on each side back on her. This is the size of my caster lines for my minis and they are normally around three pounds to four pounds, just depending if they're a buck or a doe. She is on the smaller side of perfection, but in that she does really well when it comes to judges compliments on size and type. This is Lizzie. Lizzie is a standard Rex, and if she would turn her butt around, I would show you size comparison to her butt to my hand, but I think this gives you a good idea on standard compared to the other one. Now, Lizzie is a bit large to standard. She is just under 12 pounds. She is a big girl. With that being said, when we did show her as a junior, she had very high remarks when it came to judging. I have about seven generations back and she's a pretty well-bred rabbit. Here's a video of Cyrax while I talk. She's another mini and you can see size-wise, they're not very big. Most well-bred minis are going to be under four and a half pounds. Most well-bred Rexes are going to be over nine pounds. Anything in between those two lines, it's kind of hard to tell what they were trying to do with it. But most of the time, it's very illy bred, whatever they're doing. And I should know, I had, when I was starting out, mini Rexes that were sitting at five and a half pounds, six pounds. They carried the dwarf gene, but they uh, definitely were not well bred. It has taken a very long time to get them to this standard. Now, if you're asking about making sure something is Rex or not, which are a lot of people's question, it all has to do with the fur. Both Mini Rex and Rex have this very plush fur type, and it's very unique in that the guard hairs are the length of the rest of the fur, causing this gorgeous velvet plushness that we see. So if anyone's ever wondering if they have a Rex, if they do not have this fur type, they are not a Rex. These guard hairs are not all the same length. This is not a Rex. This kind of fur right here can confuse some people, but as you see, the guard hairs are longer than the under hairs. This is not a Rex. And that comparison again of nice Rex fur. And I know your question was more on how can you tell something's mini or standard. I just know a lot of people ask questions when it comes to uh, Rex, and a lot of people will say something is a Rex when it isn't. So I figured I'd just kill two birds with one stone while showing off my buddies. Congratulations, you've got your first litter, now what? What I do is for the next couple of weeks, I check three times a day for nice full bellies on the kits. You shouldn't see mom in the nest very often. And that's a good thing, you don't want a nest sitter. I also get daily weights and handle the babies daily as well and continue that practice for two weeks until they start opening their eyes. When they start opening their eyes at two weeks, you want to make sure that their eyes aren't crusted shut. This is called nest box eye, and it's very common with young babies, especially in the spring and summer, because there is a higher bacteria load with the babies in the nest box. Also during this time frame, I would check mom to make sure she doesn't have any kind of mastitis or swelling along her chest and teats, and that they aren't warm to touch. But really, that's the most you have to worry about right now up until those kits are older than two weeks, and then there's a bunch of other fun stuff you have to look for.